Hey guys, welcome to another edition of Tugboat Talks. On today's talk, we challenge a, a topic that has been very convoluted and very controversial in the Christian faith, and that is sexuality as it relates to spirituality. Today, specifically, we, div- we dive into homosexuality and the church. So on today's podcast, we've got um, Rob Cook. Rob Cook is a Anglican priest. Um, and he is a gay affirming leader of an assembly. We discussed the recent split with a, an off branch of the Anglican Church that happened in Canada specifically, uh, as they did not support the gay marriage under the Anglican banner. We discuss uh, sexuality and spirituality as they mesh together and as, as they sort of conflict each other. But most importantly, what we really dive into is equality and this is a conversation that the church is ignoring and that I think is very important. So take a moment, challenge yourself, listen to this, um, decide if you agree or disagree. And once again, as always, if you have beliefs that contradict what are being said on this podcast, feel free to come on and voice those opinions. This is an open form of discussion. I'm happy to have anybody on here to voice your opinions so that we can discuss these topics and push any of these conversations forward. So, as always, if you found this beneficial, don't be a pansy. Share it with your friends. Like it. uh, Subscribe if you feel so inclined. Send us some feedback. uh, Let me know what you think of it. Uh, I appreciate any and all feedback, and I'm proud to be doing this and, uh, and hope that you're enjoying it. So, without further ado, here's a conversation with Rob Cook. Is my hair okay? <laughs> Perfect. Well, that's the that's the opening clip. I, just, I think I got it. I think I got it on the recording. Uh, so, introduce yourself, my friend. Uh, what do we call you, Reverend? Call me Rob. Rob Cook. Rob Cook, and you are the. What is your official title, Rob? Well, my official title is I'm the rector of the parish of Saint Mark the Evangelist. Okay, and where is that located? uh Logie bay road in st john's newfoundland okay and so and, and so and so you're so and that's an anglican assembly correct yeah. yes okay so first of all let's unpack that a little bit because i know that you are an anglican so you would be an anglican priest i guess is what they would consider you uh, right. is what you're what you're called in your in your uh religion um i was born and raised evangelical christian as a preacher's son Um, so I came up through a lot of the similar circles as I think you did. So unpack for me, if you don't mind a little bit, because I know you weren't always Anglican or born and raised Anglican. So give me a little bit of your history as to, uh, sort of your progression from in a spiritual capacity to where you ended up now leading in a, in a different denomination of which you were raised. Yeah, it's a long convoluted journey. So it started for me, um, Back in 1997, really, uh, that's the year that my wife and I, who we just had a little baby at the time, decided we were going to go off to Bible College Okay. in uh, Peterborough, Ontario. And so, because I, I felt, I thought I was going to be a, a youth pastor, and so we made the trek up there. I was there for about five minutes. And I realized I'm Uh. not going to be a pastor, (laughs) 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 but I stuck with it and spent four amazing years. I really got to say that my time at, well, when I went there, it was Eastern Pentecostal Bible college. When I left, it was master's college and seminary. I met a lot of amazing people. I had some amazing professors, learned a lot. It's really where my, uh, my desire, my hunger, my interest in theology really started. And uh, so my plan then was I was just going to do straight up academics. I was doing so full, full disclosure, my dad also graduated from that same uh, Bible college. Really? Would, yeah, he would have. He graduated from Eastern. I played Baby Jesus in like a Christmas cantata or something, uh, and it was somewhere around mid '80s. So obviously, wouldn't cross over with you. But uh, in in the effort of full disclosure, so you and my dad are both graduated from the same educational facility. So cool, cool. I meet so many people who went there. It was and Newfoundlanders. There was a disproportionate number of Newfoundlanders 
uh, at least back then. I don't I don't know what it's like now. Newfoundlanders um, have Newfoundlanders have always gravitated heavily gravitated towards um, like what, for lack of a better term we'll call it the work of the Lord, whether it being you know some sort of uh, some sort of uh, theological or spiritual based uh, career path we'll say you know what I mean or interest at least that and the military yes for some strange reason right I don't know why. Uh, so my plan was to just do academics. I was going to do undergrad, master's degree, and eventually a PhD. Uh, so when it came time to uh, start thinking about my master's degree, I'd applied to a couple of different schools, but my wife, you know, said, well, why don't we go back east to do your master's degree? So I didn't really know that there was anywhere back here to do a master's degree in theology. So I looked into it and I discovered Queens College. Right. Which is the Anglican Seminary here in St. John's. Okay. Applied there, got accepted, and that was really my gateway into Anglicanism. Gotcha. I really, a friend of mine, uh, a priest who's deceased now, he, he said that I studied my way into the Anglican Church. And, and I think he's right, because what really attracted me to the Anglican Church was the rich liturgical tradition, uh, the theological uh, tradition, but also the sense that you could be almost any kind of Anglican and still be an Anglican, like and still get together and pray and worship. It's like this big tent where everybody is, is welcome and you could be like Catholic and you could be evangelical. You could be high church with all the bells and smells and you could be low church and just like t-shirt and hood, you know, and, I love that. I love the diversity of, of Anglicanism. That's really what drew me me over to, to that. So even at that point in time, inclusivity uh, under the church banner was very important. Uh, it always was, even as a little kid. And when we get into some more of this stuff about how my whole journey into, you know, being more open and in inclusive, it started when I was basically a teenager. Okay, so... So, so give us some of that. So, cause obviously you were, you were born and raised, um, evangelical, uh, Pentecostal, right? Yeah. As small was all, town. And small town too. Small town, Newfoundland, Pentecostal, which is a whole different. So where are you from originally? I'm from Leading Tickles. Okay. There you go. <laughs> um, which is like the, the, you know, the little, you know, they always say like, uh, central Newfoundland is like the buckle of the Bible belt. Right. Well, leading tickles is that pin that goes into the hole on the belt that keeps everything. That's, Listen, man, you don't have to tell me, up. dude. I lived in Packet. I lived in Galtus. I lived in Gander Bay. Uh, we lived out in Trinity Bay out by Bonavista. Like, I've lived in all corners of Newfoundland. Um, and was a black sheep in every one of them. <laughs> so, <Yeah>, me too. <laughs> so, okay, so continue on. Um, so, what was it that you felt? So, so through your, so was the inclusivity piece a big part of the piece that pulled you over to, like, I mean, you obviously you ended up as full time employment under the Anglican banner. So, sort of, mm -hmm. you know, so how did that come about? Well, uh, so going back to when we came to St. John's, so right. I was, I was, my, my journey out of the Pentecostal church was in full swing at that time. And like now I have no ill feelings towards, you know, my former, you know, how I was raised or anything like that. Well, and, and in, in, full, in full transparency, I'm still an active member of a, of a Pentecostal based assembly. So, it, you know, go ahead. Yeah, I've, wor I've worked my way through a lot of shit, right? So, but I'm in, I'm in a good place with all that now. And a lot of my good friends and colleagues are from the, from that tradition. So I have total respect. But at that particular time, it just wasn't doing it for me. And I knew I had to find something else. Right. So I had, you know, kind of shopped around, I guess, for some, for a church home. Couldn't really find anything. And then I was approached by the church where I serve now, St. Mark's. They wanted me to come and help them do some work with their youth group. And they said, you don't have to come to our church. We just need your help to get this going. So I came here, and that was in 2006 or something. I've been here 15 years at St. Wow. Mark's. So I started as the youth minister, but right away, myself, my wife, my two girls 
fell in love with St. Mark's. We were welcomed with open arms. Everybody was so open-minded and inclusive. We were just like, oh shit, this is, this is what we've been looking for all this time. Now there's a steep learning curve with all the, the more liturgical side of things. Sure. Yeah, no, of course. What really, what really drew us into this parish community was just the, the acceptance, the love, the open-mindedness, which was like everything I was looking for. So I started off as the youth minister, did that for five years. Then I was the associate priest for five years. And now I'm into my fifth year as the rector, which would in, in your speak be like lead pastor. Gotcha. Right. So that's, that's how that transition happened. So a big part of the reason that I wanted to get you to come on the podcast today is that I know that you are um, homosexual affirming, right? Mm-hmm. In you, in the church. Um, can you unpack that? Cause there was, there was a little bit of confusion because it was the Anglican church that just went through a big sort of like vote or something, right? Yes. Uh, okay. So can you unpack that even for my own clarity? Because I don't really fully understand. I read the article about, you know, when it went down, but yeah. um, I don't, I don't, you know, getting it from a piece of paper is not really going to do it justice. Yeah. So in order to do that justice, I've got to back up, my goodness, 20 years or more, because yeah. the Anglican church has been engaged in conversations around sexuality and, and, and marriage for at least 25 years, may, maybe longer. Right, okay. At, at various different levels. So all of that culminated about uh, nine years ago when uh, a motion came to the floor of Synod, which would be like the national conference for the Anglican Church of Canada, for um, to to move forward with marriage equality, gotcha. right? which would say that uh, marriage is not limited to just a, a, a one man and one woman, but could be, sex uh, gender shouldn't really define who's eligible for the sacrament of marriage. That that it didn't happen at, at that synod, so that would have been. 2016, 2013, around 2009, 2010. But what that kicked off was a more intentional conversation uh, around that whole issue. And so uh, delegates from that synod went back to their home diocese and really engaged in, or or were supposed to have engaged in some really intentional conversation around marriage equality. Now, the way that the Anglican Church makes decisions uh, we don't do anything when it comes to decisions like this. We don't just say, okay, we're going to change now. And, you know, it takes, it's a long process. So for, to change something that's considered doctrine, uh, there needs to be a two thirds yes vote from each of the three houses of synod, which would be bishops, clergy, and laity at two consecutive synods. Okay, so uh, when they gathered in 2016, the vote was yes. So then they still needed to gather again in 2019, and there had to be another two-thirds yes vote from all three houses. Okay, so it took them, so it took them three years to make that decision because they did yes. it like any typical church, <laughs> but I mean, in all seriousness, it is, you know, you're affecting the doctrine of the church. So it is a big deal, right? Yes. And one of the big concerns through the entire conversation, especially in the last eight to 10 years has been the voice of indigenous communities, right? We didn't want this to be something that, uh, you know, settler church, imposes on the uh, on the indigenous church as we have done with so many things down through the years with devastating consequences so we, we didn't want that to happen so we wanted them to maintain their voice but also people from the lgbtq community and those who affirm them to be able to move forward as well we but we, we wanted to all move together right which gotcha. is fucking impossible. <laughs> it's right. really, really, really hard. But that's what community is, right? When you're in community with people, it's never neat and tidy and pretty and everybody agrees all the time and things kumbaya all the time. 
No. That's not the way community works. So at the Synod in 2019, uh, the vote was rejected. Oh. By the bishops. So laity supported it with an overwhelming majority. Clergy, same. Bishops, it failed. So the highest ranking sort of court of the church, we'll say. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, kind of, because see, Anglicanism is so convoluted. Right? Because what happened after that was that the bishops just said, we're going to do it anyways. Oh? Yeah. So, which sparks a whole other conversation, but what's the role of the bishop? And who gets to decide where the spirit is leading the church? Sure. Right? So for Anglicans, we're Episcopal. We're, we're an Episcopal church, unlike the Pentecostal church, which would be, which would be Congregationalist. Gotcha. So the local congregation makes the majority of decisions that affects that church or that denomination. Right? Well, yes, but uh, the reality... You're, you're, but you're more of a hybrid, right? You're, you're Congregationalist, but then there's some Presbyterial kind of things with you guys as well, right? Nobody is a pure church governance anymore, right? Even the Episcopal Church now, it's not, the, the bishop does not rule by decree. No, and I mean, it seems to me more and more that the longer that I've spent in evangelical circles, the more that these churches are run by social mandates as opposed to spiritual or theological. Yeah. Right? No different hours. No, no, yeah, sure, of course, you know what I mean? But, um a big part of the reason why I wanted to get on here with you is to unpack sort of your learning curve, because like, like we said, you are, you know, homosexual affirming. Um, that is not commonplace in the evangelical Christian church. For me, it's a big part. It's a big piece of contention because I do have a lot of gay friends. Um, mm -hmm. I do have a lot of people that I love from that community. Um, and it's devastating to me to know people who have grown up in the in the Christian church, especially the evangelical church, and went through these issues and struggles, and and I you know I can't imagine what that journey is hard enough of a journey to come into who you are as a person, period. Let alone then when you're struggling with uh, confusion or or lack of acceptance around your sexuality, and so to translate that then into the space of navigating the Christian church and social constructs and the, the tribalism of your community when, when you were born and raised in a specific assembly of church or whatever, and then all of a sudden now you're feeling, even if you're not, but you're feeling very outcast. To me, that's, it's devastating. It's not at all the model for what Jesus was trying to show us. I, I don't think so. And, um, the best way I can go about this is is just is to just tell you some stories. Okay. Okay. So uh, to pick up on what you just said about you know the difficulty that people must go through who are coming to terms with their not only their sexuality but or their sexual orientation but you know how their community views that and then also how 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 God views them. Yeah. Right. So a few years ago, I was lucky enough to be involved with the local pride community here with uh, an event around Pride Week, which was called Out in Faith. And it, it's still going on now. The year that it started, it was uh, a panel conversation. Myself, one of my parishioners from St. Mark's, who's, who's gay, openly gay, was on the panel. Another local, uh, well, she's an a, an author, Trudy Morgan Cole. I don't know if you've heard Trudy. Okay. She's from the uh, Seventh-day Adventist church. And then there was someone from the Jewish community. And so we were just, you know, our experience, mine for being affirming, and then, you know, people's own experience within faith communities. But there was like, the room was full of people, gay and lesbian people, transgendered people who well, they're there, so they must have a, a vested interest in, in yeah. religion and spirituality. And so the night kind of turned into them kind of just telling their stories of pain and rejection and abuse at the hands of their faith communities, right? 
how they had been cast out of not only just their faith communities, but their families. Yeah. Right. Totally rejected. But yet there was still this desire in them to, to be connected with God, right? Or to acknowledge that they're still connected with God, yep. to be a part of a faith community where they could go and worship, receive communion, um, hear from the scriptures, you know, just be part of a, of a religious community, right? So even after all that rejection, all that abuse, all that, you know, um, heartbreak, uh, heartbreak, they, there's still this longing to be a part of something. Yeah. I don't know if I could, if that was me, I don't know. I, I just can't, I, I don't understand what would make them want to keep coming back, but I do know what it is because it's this, we're all created in the image of God. We all have this God shaped space within us that's built not just for God, but built for other people, right? We're built to be in communion with other people. Yeah. And I think the church and I, and I can't say it's all just the evangelical church, but the, the church, you know, writ large has been horrible to gay and lesbian and transgendered people, but yet they still desire to be a part of the communities that we have. Right. So that's one story that kind of gives you some insight into where I'm coming from. The other one I'll go back to very early in my life. I was probably still a teenager and it was in Sunday school one day and the conversation as often is in that tradition was about sin. Okay. And I remember the conversation being around. So are all, is all sin equal? Is there some sin that's worse? Is there some sin that's not so bad? Right. And the Sunday school teacher was saying that, yeah, there, there was sin that was worse than other kinds of sin. And I, I was like, okay, well, give us an example. And so homosexuality was the, was the example that he gave. And so as a kid growing up in like small town Newfoundland, that wasn't really even something that was really on my radar. Right. But then that got me thinking, right? So if homosexuality is sin, is it any worse than anything else? Right? So that really pushed me to, to think and reflect and study and try to find out more about this. So this really was my leaping off point. Because my first thing, in, instinct was, well, if it is a sin, it's no worse than anything else. It's no worse than the person who's the glutton. It's no worse than the person who, who is a... Uh, a gossip is no worse than the person who is, you know, sleeping with the neighbor's wife. Like, why well, would why would I, that person be excluded from the church when all these other people have the opportunity to repent and come back? And right? well, and there's there's such an innate hypocrisy that exists in all of us as it pertains to our spiritual walk with regards to. Uh, I've I've said this many times with regards to visual visual or visible sin versus invisible sin, and we're not we're not talking about sexuality as a sin in general now, or or is or isn't, uh, because you know for me I'm not uh, this conversation is not about passing that judgment, it's about um, unpacking people's beliefs and letting them realize what did they what they've been taught and where did it come from? Did it come from social constructs or did it come from biblical teaching? Did it come from theological doctrine? You know, where did it come from? Right. And that, that process of deconstruction for me has been an active one for a last number of years because I had to realize that there was a lot of stuff that I learned growing up as a preacher's kid that was social or, you know, in nature, uh, social engagement rules and rules of this tribe that I was a part of that I no longer really adhered to, or that didn't fit the mold that I was expressing in my own spirituality. Right. And so, you know, a big part of the conversation, like I've had this conversation, of course, with, you know, older members of my family and whatnot. And, um, the conversation for me always comes back to bottom line for me is if I had ultimate power and I could decide 
even if I did think that that it was it was uh, homosexuality or sexual, you know, was a sin, if it was my decision to decide for you if you were going to live a holy life mm-hmm. of solitude, or and be lonely for the rest of your life, or you could actually live and enjoy your life with someone that you loved, I could never make that decision. How could you possibly condemn a person to a life of loneliness when when everybody is just trying to seek connection with either the community, a loved one, or with God? Yeah, and when heterosexual Christian marriage is held up as this, you know, ideal, but when so many of those marriages are loveless and unfaithful, and then I see... Uh, same-sex couples who are devoted to each other, faithful to each other, love each other. I see, I see Christ in their love and commitment, right? Who am I to deny that, right? I mean, in my, in our tradition, we view marriage as a sacrament, right? And the the one of the images that we use for that is the relationship between Christ and the church. So as Christ gives his life for the church, the church in return gives its life for Christ. That's the, really the foundation for Christian marriage. That doesn't have to be, I don't put it, you, I mean, you could put a gender on that if you want to, but it's not there in the original image. So, even, so even for you as a very young man in a, you know, born, at what age would this have been where you started to sort of question 15, 16. But I was always a shit disturber too, right? Like I always asked really tough questions and I was not satisfied with pat answers. And I would go and try to figure stuff out for myself. A hundred percent. And I was always encouraged to do that. Like my mother, who, who was a really religious person in our family, always encouraged me to do that. So I was an avid reader. Uh, now, most of the stuff that I read back then was junk or I consider junk now, you know, the Left Behind series and all that stuff. Right, right. But I was always an avid reader, and I wanted to know more. I wanted to figure stuff out and think and reflect, and I'm still like that today. But so that's really what what got me got me going. So in your journey, what have you have you struggled with evidence that homosexuality is a sin? Like, have you ever, you know, since that, because, you know, we were, I was born and raised to grow up, you know, being taught that that was, that that was incorrect or, or that you were living inappropriately if you were, if you're doing that. Um, and so for me, it was, uh, it was an unlearning process, right. To get, of, of getting to know people and putting faces on these circumstances. Right. Yeah. And now all of a sudden it wasn't, it wasn't just about <laughs> uh gay rights and 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 you know straight rights and and uh christianity as a whole what it was about a specific person like a friend of mine from college who grew up now and is gay and you know whatever right so have you ever have you ever struggled with that and and was there like even no matter how short was there a journey for you and what did that journey look like Well, for me too, it was encountering people that I loved and that, and that I had known for a long time who, who came out as, as gay. And there was one cousin in particular, I was really very close with. And I remember it was actually when I was way up Bible college and he came out and I remember having a phone conversation with him, you know, talking about all this. And I was still kind of trying to figure out my way through all this stuff. I think I was, in the beginning of being more open and open-minded about it, but I still wasn't where I am right now. And so I remember our conversation and, you know, and, and, you know, saying to him, do you think you were born this way? And uh, he said, yeah, I was, I was born this way. I was, I was created this way. And I said, so do you think that that's okay with, with God? And he said, no. And I thought, holy fuck. You think you were, you were born this way, made this way, but God hates you because of it. Whoa, that has really got to mess you up. Well, I mean, that is, the, that is the levels of existential and spiritual guilt that people are struggling with. Definitely. 
definitely. Yep. And I had an, another uh, close relative who, you know, said, you know, growing up and, and trying to not be gay, not act gay, like this voice running in your head all the time. Don't say that. You're going to sound gay. Right. Don't, don't, don't sit like that. People are going to people are going to know you're gay. Right. Don't don't wear that outfit. Don't comb your hair like that. I, so part of me now, I, I, what I'm struggling with so much is that you see that you see these conversations being unpacked in um, other denominations, right? Uh, like Anglican specifically, um, uh, and a ton of other ones that I won't reference specifically right now, but you know, of uh, denominations of which we both have friends who are clergy, and you know, the the conversation is very open around homosexuality and and LGBTQ community and inclusiveness in the church. It's, de it's devastating to me that not only not like we're not having those conversations in the, in the, in the current evangelical church in, in my world. Yeah. Um, and I think that that could be truth, truth. Like that could be true for a lot of say the, uh, the Southern, you know, maybe Southern Baptist convention, uh, any of these more sort of um, traditional, uh, you know, I don't know what what we would call it, but um, there's a lot of there's a lot of denominations and a lot of spiritual communities uh, right now that are not entertaining this conversation, and I think that it's they're doing themselves a disservice. Like, yeah, I, I, yeah and just so people don't think we're piling on the. Uh poor old evangelicals. I mean, this conversation has not happened in the Roman Catholic tradition either. Right. No, even, sure. as, even as progressive, some, some things that Pope Francis has, has said has been very progressive. I mean, for the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church to say, who am I to judge? It's right. like, dude, you're the Pope. <laughs> if anybody can judge, you're the judge. But right. for him to say that, but then he makes some other comments about, you know, uh, that come across as very, if not homophobic, very, you know, anti-gay, right? So sure. there's no big, wide conversation happening there, even within the Anglican church. I mean, there's a lot of people, there's a whole breakaway uh, Anglican church in Canada now because of this, right? The Anglican network in Canada is uh, a breakaway Anglicans who are not okay with gay marriage so that would yeah so that would be a more traditional sect now of that that it's that's broken yes. off because of this issue yeah right and, so you know i think where the conversation gets stalled is pe people say um well the bible says yeah right the bible says it's a sin the bible says it's an abomination right to which I would say, the Bible doesn't say a friggin' thing about loving, monogamous, same-sex relations. It does not say anything so, for or against. So what? So what evidence um, is like? Do you do you have these conversations? Because the conversations don't come up to me uh, very, very, uh, very often. Because people know that I'd like to have these conversations um, and perhaps that I'm well versed in it, but like, what do, what do you say to people who are of the mindset that this is, that their beliefs, um, you know, conflict with what you believe, right? Like, you know, people who do believe that homosexuality um, is, is an abomination to God or whatever, like what, first of all, what evidence is put forward uh, for that? And if, if there is evidence, and what's your opinion or interpretation of that? It's a hard conversation to have. I got to be completely honest. And because I think we're so. It's a very emotionally charged subject. Very emotionally charged. And, and unless... it's, it's difficult to have those conversations without devolving into a, a more irate individual, we'll say. Yeah. And you come with all of this baggage, right? Like I come to the conversation with all, with all my experiences you know, with, with friends, relatives, parishioners, all of these people, all of these experiences, all of the things that I've read, I bring that all to a conversation. I, I, you know, the, the opposite point of view comes with the same, same experience, right? 
uh, relationships, uh, you know, things that they've read and experienced themselves, all comes to that point where you sit down across the table from each other, or God forbid, on Facebook somewhere where you're trying to, you know, hash this, which is horrible. But, you know, I think one of the big obstacles is just how, how we even read and understand scripture. What is, what is scripture, right? Because I think so much of scripture is you find what's already in your heart there. Yeah, very right? much so. So if you start, so if I'm starting from the point of view that I think homosexuality is, is okay, that gay people should be welcomed uh, and embraced as, as well as straight people should be, that should, they should be afforded the sacrament of marriage, I will go to scripture and I will find things to support that. Yeah. If you think that it's a sin, that it should not be allowed in the church, or that people, if you are gay, well, then you should practice celibacy. Uh, you will find evidence for that in scripture. Right. I, I think you will. In the same way, if you're a racist, you'll read scripture and you'll find racist things. If oh, you're a misogynist, you will read scripture and you will find misogynist text to back up what your beliefs are. Yeah. If you're a passionate advocate for social justice, you will read scripture and you will find evidence for what you believe. Well, it's really interesting because, you know, you get all these, you get all these things thrown around. I, I get the Leviticus stuff thrown at me all the time because of tattoos. Right. And, uh, you know, then you've got to have a conversation with somebody on packing hermeneutics and how the old Testament translates to the new Testament and, you know, how the, how you've got, truths that are considered for all time versus, you know, for a specific period of time. Uh, and I, you know, in preparation for this conversation, I was looking up some stuff and it's interesting because the only thing that I could find was, is Leviticus 18, uh, 22. And I'm sure that somebody will throw other verses at me sometime down the road, which is fine. There's, there's six of them. They're called the clobber passages. Okay. Is that what they're called? The what? The clobber passages. It's Cause you use them to clobber people. Right. Yes. Exactly. And, <laughs> and, and forgive me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the Bible was ever to be used as a weapon. Also, considering the fact, we, we know for a fact that the Bible has been altered several times throughout the course of history to fit specific agendas. We know yeah. this for a fact, right? So uh, anyway, it, it's what's hilarious to me is that no, like people are so preoccupied with getting in other people's shit, man. It's, <laughs> Yeah. It's unreal. It's like, I got enough stuff to worry about in my own life and my own walk with Christ that I don't need to be preaching at anybody on the side of the road. If you, if you were down at like, dude, the, one of the things that made me the sickest of my, I've ever seen in my whole life was I was in Vegas and I was on the corner of the street and one of the boys goes, Oh look, there's one of your, well, there's one of your guys right now. And I was like, dude, that dude doesn't belong to me. And it was like, you know, God hates whatever and with a megaphone. And I'm like, man, you got to have your shit seriously dialed in when it comes to your relationship with God. If you're going out standing on a corner, like I think we should bring back striking down. God should strike people down dead again. You know what I mean? <laughs> let them have it, man. If you're being, if you're using Jesus to be that much of a dick, let them have it. Drop them dead right on the spot. But we live in such a polarized world right now. Viciously polarized. Right? There's no in between. Right. Either you're 100% with me or you're my enemy. Like there's no, there's no grace anymore. Look at, look at Canadian and U S political relations. Everything is an extreme left or an extreme right. There is no, there is no happy middle anymore. It doesn't exist because you divide and conquer and we won't get into like crazy political, uh, you know, well, um, and really the left and the right, they're mirrors of each other anyways. Yeah. A hundred percent. And it's funny because, you know, I get the conversation all the time about, well, I, you, you know, I've literally had people say to me, so what's the deal with you being Christian and not being retarded? Like that was the exact <laughs> words that were said to me. And the only reason I repeat that is because that's, I need, you need, we need cr modern Christian church to understand how they're perceived by a lot of people. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm hoping that one of the things that will come out of the, the Trump era is that the church will get a nice hard look at itself and not just the evangelical church but because like catholics are totally on board with a lot of this stuff too right yeah and just the ugliness the 
the the meanness the and the like the intellectual bankruptcy of so much of this stuff that i'm hoping that the church will that this is will be an apocalyptic moment for the church and what what i mean by apocalyptic is not the you know the end of the world but like because uh, apocalypse means to to lift the veil to reveal something okay i hope this will, will be an apocalyptic moment for the church when you know the veil will be lifted and they will just see how ugly and ignorant and judgmental the world sees them and that they will then move to be more christ-like i mean i think to because to me like i i read scripture through the lens of jesus right, right. so i don't give a fuck what leviticus says Real, I don't. Best best <laughs> quote ever. That's going on the YouTube. That's going on the YouTube thing. Um, <laughs> I'm more concerned. What is Jesus like? Because I think Jesus gives me a good glimpse of what God is like, and He gives me a good glimpse of what it means to be human, and how to treat other people. And I don't think for a second that Jesus would be caught up in all of this condemnation and sexual politics and who's in and who's it because he was always overturning all that stuff and Man, playing, he, he right? said i was reading a, i was reading a, a verse earlier and he said did, <clears throat> did no one here condemn you no they didn't well then neither do i go about and be free of your sin right you know what i mean and then you want to like anyway you were talking about the clobbering verses what what struck me is really funny is is uh you know you got this one verse here Leviticus 18.22, do not have sexual relationships with a man uh, as one does with a woman. That is detestable. What's hilarious about that is that this is a list of don'ts from a sexual standpoint, and that is number 22. Okay? And number one in Leviticus also, just as a friendly reminder to anybody, uh, if you're following the book of Leviticus, make sure you stand up every time a senior person enters the room don't mark your body with tattoos. And also, if you're wearing anything that's a cotton polyester blend, you better throw it out because you can't wear mixed fabrics, right? So this is this is what we're talking about. Um, and it's that, it, John, is, is that what we were saying earlier, what I was saying earlier? If it's something you believe, you yeah. will find it in Scripture, right? So, that's what makes the Bible a dangerous book. Well, then I had a very interesting conversation with uh, with Brad, Null, Dr. Brad Knoll a little while ago, and we were having a conversation around uh, suicide and the beliefs around suicide because the the the, the modern uh, evangelical Christian church, like Protestant church, has adopted a lot of that from Catholicism. And a lot of times we have beliefs, either they're theological, you know, whatever, that have been taught to us through a like a through a obviously through social aspects right passed down from you know good old granny so and so or aunt so and so in the church who tells you how you're supposed to believe with a oh my that's some shock i can't believe they're at that now today right like you know what i mean like and and people are taking that as gospel when in reality like i realize that i can grow up and i can like the generational disconnect now, uh, even especially amongst the more extreme, we'll, we'll call the more extreme aspects of the church, like uh, evangelical uh, Christians, is that the youngest generation now is like, what do you mean we can't have a drink? Like, yeah, we can have a drink. I, you know, I can, I can drink and, and be composed and enjoy my company of my friends and have a good Christianity, of, have a good conversation, sorry, about Christ in a bar. Whereas traditional, uh, traditional older generations won't even dance to a song on the radio, right? And the interesting thing about that for me is that we have this tribalism and we're so afraid to offend people who have grown up with things being a certain way because then that impacts the tribe to which they now belong. Yeah. And don't take my sense of belonging away from me because this is where I've always fit in. I know how to fit in here. So please don't change it. I think that that's a lot of what we're dealing with in uh, what I would like to consider more antiquated uh, sex of, you know, sex of the, uh, of the church. I, I think to, you know, the, the, the generation that you're, talking about 
because in, in, in my tradition, it's completely different. Some of the most open and progressive people that I've encountered over the years are people who are elderly. Okay. Because I get the sense they're just at the point in their life where they've lived their life and they realize what really matters now. And it's not all these rules and regulations and being the gatekeepers for who gets a bit of God. It's they just want as many people to be part of this as possible. They've had their children come out to them and their grandchildren come out to them and realize that what's more important to me is my love that I have for my children and my grandchildren, not this antiquated, you know, sense of, of, of morality. Right. Um, <clears throat> but I think the reason why within the church people are so resistant to, to letting go of some of these things is that while the rest, while they perceive the rest of the world going to shit, at least in the church, we can keep the same beliefs, the same practices. So while the rest of the world changes, we're not going to change. We're in our bubble. We're, we're right? safe in our bubble. But not recognizing that the church has often been on the forefront of big social change. Right? Yeah. Uh, slavery. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was Christians who, who, who said, no, this, this is wrong. And they, they were up against people who were using scripture to legitimize the slave trade and, and the holding of slaves because they went to the scripture and they found it. Right. Right. Um, you know, the, the ordination of women, right. Your, your tradition was on, was really on the forefront of allowing women to lead congregations. Right. Right. Yeah. That was frowned upon. Man, you know, the, Sister Garrigus, man, brought it all, brought it back to Newfoundland. Right. The the civil rights movement in, in the U.S. back in the 60s and, and, and in Canada as well was led, there was a lot of Christians involved and it was their faith that really, you know, led them to do that. But again, right. they were arguing with people who were using the same Bible to say it was legitimate to have these Jim, Jim Crow laws that kept whites and blacks separate. Yeah. I see no difference now with the ongoing conversation around homosexuality. It's the same issue. Yeah. And I, and I, and you know, like, uh, you know, for a lot of us, anybody with any amount of foresight could look at this and be like, well, I want to be on the right side of history. When in reality, how arrogant do you have to be to think that history is going to recollect you whatsoever anyway? You know what I mean? Like the reality is that there's very few names in the history books. Um, and so if you're, if you're feared of standing up for what you believe or, or impacting social change, listen, all you can do is love on people, man, show them Jesus. Um, and uh and just go about your life being concerned with your own shit and helping others like you know what i mean walk your own path and if that path leads you to somebody else who needs help then help them along the way be the hands and feet of jesus uh that we're meant to be to meant to be called uh to do and like we got a saying in the motorcycle club like just don't be a dick about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that's to totally yes that should be uh, uh, the preface to every translation of the Bible should have that in the, in the liner notes. Don't be a dick about it. Like. Just don't be a dick about it. Like, you know, um, well, listen, I won't keep you for much longer. Do you have anything else? Uh, any other pearls of wisdom or, or, uh, or stories that you can share with us to sort of, uh, you know, drive home your, your stance or your personal experience when it comes to this issue? <clears throat> um, so this year, well, 2019, towards the end of October, I had the privilege to preside over the first same-gendered uh, marriage in the Anglican Church here in Newfoundland. Okay. And uh, I tell you, it was the most beautiful experience of my, not even my professional life, but just my life. The couple that was married, I've, I've known them for 15 years, my whole time here, and got to journey with them and get to know them. They've been involved here at St. Mark's, served on our vestry, which will be our like our board, um, you know, reading scripture in church, um, 
writing prayers, heavily, heavily involved in the life of St. Mark's. But there was this one thing that was keeping them from full inclusion within our community. And it wasn't us. It was from, from the outside. It was, you know, as Anglicans, we couldn't, we couldn't extend the sacrament of marriage to them. And so finally, because we had advocated this for this for so long, and so on that day, on Saturday, uh, we gathered. And I would say there must have been 300 people in the church that day for a wedding. A lot of St. Mark's people who came out to share in that special day between these two people, Rick and Steve. Uh, and it was so beautiful and so emotional to finally see these two people who love each other so much, who love God, who serve Jesus, support this church, to finally be able to welcome them fully into our church family was just so friggin awesome like was, i was i was i was like on cloud nine for days afterwards and the whole community was because we were just so excited and i would say anybody like we st mark's has a facebook page go to our facebook page there's a ton of pictures on there from that day just look at the joy in people's faces Look at the way that they embraced each other when we finally pronounced them, you know, wed in the eyes of, of God and the church. It was just so beautiful. Well, and this why is would we, why this would we want to deny people that? Why? Like, I don't understand. Well, and this is this is what I this is why I wanted to have this conversation with you is because, you know, no, paramount number one for me is people to have a relationship with God. And, and however that is, I don't like, and to be honest with you, if you have, if you're seeking a relationship with God and it's not even through Jesus, like if that's your journey, man, then that's your journey. Like I'm not, and to, to some people that'll be a little wishy-washy. It'll be whatever. The truth uh-huh. of the matter is the truth <laughs> of the matter is God makes the most sense to me through the narrative of Jesus Christ. Exactly. Right? You know, and so the the kicker for me is I want to throw out this lightning rod for all the peop for people who have who are either currently struggling with alienation from their church or growing up in a denomination where they feel that they can't be included. Um, you can be included. There's a place where you can belong. You can be an active part of a church, contib- uh, contribute to the body of Christ, and have a relationship with Jesus and and pursue the face of God no matter what other people tell you about the way that you live the rest of your life. You're made in the image of God. You are a beloved child of God. And there are faith communities out there. And I'm not putting in a pitch for St. Mark's because I know there's lots of other places too. But you just got to find your place. And I would say too, if you can't find a place, create a place. Create one. Gather people around you. I'm not, sh- I'm not saying that the church should be like this homogenous, everybody looks the same and believes the same, but surround yourself with people who will accept you and love you and that you can love and accept them as well. To me, that's church, right? Yeah. We make it really complicated sometimes and, you know, it's got to be this denomination and you got to have this ordained person in charge of you and you got to collect tithes and do... Fuck no. All you need is people. What Jesus people had Jesus had people and a table and the spirit. That's pretty much it. Yeah. That's all you need for church. And you know what? And if you can't make it, if you can't make it, then find somewhere else to do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because if you're getting shut down on that stuff and all you're trying to do is connect people with God and you're getting shut down on it or, or, or you're, you yourself are trying to connect with God and have a relationship with Christ and you're getting shut down on it, find somewhere else to do it, man. Because uh, if, if, they, if people won't accept you for who you are, then that's not where you're supposed to be. And all this stuff, what we, what we call church, here in, in the West, it's all disappearing anyways. In the next 10 to 15 years, the church here will be unrecognizable. Right. Places like St. Mark's or Bethesda or the, you know, Salvation Army Temple or, you know, Basilica, it's all going to disappear. And we're going to go back to a much more New Testament way of being the church, which is just people gathered around in, in living rooms and in coffee shops and in pubs and just 
breaking bread together, drinking together, having conversation together, and serving the community together. That's where we're going back to. And I think it's a beautiful thing. It is going to be beautiful. And you know what? In the, in the interest of pissing off all the people that we haven't pissed off already, listen, Christian's got Justin Bieber and Kanye West now, so we're going to – you know what I mean? The future is <laughs> wide open. <laughs> God help us. Yeah, God help us all. Uh, listen, and, and we're here doing an internet conversation about it. So, um, you know, oh, this, God help us all. To me, like, this is another sign of the uh, democratizing of, of the church, right? That the technology is really leveling the playing field now, right? Right. And so, like, uh, in the last few weeks, it's been, you know, beautiful to see my denomination stumbling and fumbling their way into a lot of this stuff and that's encouraging i'm a little disheartened to see that it's it's all clergy it's all ordained professionals who are doing it and so at some point i'm going to have to throw out a challenge and say as far as i can remember you know worship prayer is not only the domain of the ordained clergy it is the work of the people so how about we see some some lay people yep. step up 100%. and do the kind of things that you're doing? Engage in conversation, draw people into prayer, be the leaders when it takes and when you know, and organizing people to go out and, and serve serve the community. Um, because again, us we're we're a dying breed, us clergy, right? It's going to be increasingly hard for churches to pay someone to do this shit. Yeah, it is. It's got to be people. The church is the people. We got to start believing and acting like that. Right? Listen, man, I appreciate your time today. Uh, thanks so much for coming on. We will do a, whether you want to post for St. Mark's or not, we will, because if nothing else, I want people who find this video to be able to find a safe space to be able to do spiritual, yeah. uh, a spiritual walk. So uh, once again, thanks for coming on today. I really do appreciate the time. Thank you so much for having me. It was a blast. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. And that's a wrap. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. hope you valued the discussion that we had today. Um, if there's something there that you disagree with, please feel free to shoot me a message. Uh, if you're open to coming on and discussing it, we'd love to do that as well. Um, please take this as food for thought. Challenge your own beliefs. Pull it apart. Decide what you believe and what you don't. Um, and push forward in equality and with love for everyone. So we hope you take that to the bank and that uh, you continue to push your life forward in such a capacity. So God bless. Have a great day.